Greetings, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Um, again, I'm usually pretty excited about all the webinars I do. Um, this one is a very, very excellent talk, uh, um, a very excellent topic that we're talking about today, and also a topic that's been um, by far the most requested. So we're going to talk about um, survivor, immigrant survivors and survivors who are not um, U.S. citizens. So um, let me go over a few fun housekeeping um, little things here. All right, so first off, um, we'd like to thank the Office of Violence Against Women for, of course, funding all of our webinars and funding the, the work that we do. Definitely love that and definitely love to um, be able to provide webinars um, for all the folks um, that we are able to provide webinars for. All right, and so this webinar is interactive. Um, we are lucky enough to have um, Emily McKenzie, who is an immigration lawyer and has been an immigration lawyer for almost a, a decade. Um, please ask your questions because this is the perfect person um, for you to be able to get your answers. Um, okay, so how um, you are able to interact during this um, webinar is if you have a control panel that looks um, like the slide that's on your screen right now, great. If not, um, go ahead and click that little orange arrow and that will expand the control panel and also retract um, the control panel. So um, you will be able to um, also raise your hand um, during this webinar. So if I ask you a question, if Emily asks a question, um, you can click this little raise hand button and we can kind of see like, oh, you know, how many folks have worked with um, um, undocumented survivors and we can um, kind of get a tally of how many of the folks that are on the webinar um, that have um, worked with folks, so on and so forth. Um, and then down here under the, the, the question section, this is the box. This is the, the part of the control panel that we will be utilizing the most. And if you've been on any of our other webinars, um, especially in the past couple months, this is um, the, the most interactive part of, of our webinars. So um, I would like everyone to try out this question box. Um, and if I can get uh, everyone to type in there kind of where you're from, you know, what you do, are you an advocate? Do you work for the state? Um, um, you know, what state are you from? Where are you connecting from? Kind of tell me a little bit, a little bit about you. Where are you from? Um, all right, let's see. Ooh, we've got a bunch of folks so far. Okay, it looks like we have ooh, folks from all um, across Utah. Um, we also have some folks from Alabama. Nice, I really love when our Alabama folks um, hop on. We have caseworkers. Um, we have system advocates that are on here. Um, ooh, a lot of folks from Southern Utah. Love it, <laughs> love it. A lot of folks from Southern Utah. Um, we have community-based advocates. Oh, we got a couple social workers as well. A um, bunch of folks from the Salt Lake City area. Ooh, nice, nice. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, and we're going to be utilizing this the most through the webinar, so I'm glad that we're getting familiar, <laughs> familiar with that so far. Okay, and also below that, um, there will be um, handouts available to um, download throughout the webinar. Um, I will be putting those in a little bit um, later um, during the webinar. Um, and yeah, that should be should be it for the webinar um, control panel. If you have any questions, um, go ahead and send me a question, and um, we will be able to um, get those answered. All right. So really quickly, I'd like to um, go over a little bit of who we are. Um, so I, I work for the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition, and we are the federally recognized um, state anti-domestic violence coalition for Utah. Um, so what that means is basically we're a support organization for all the organizations, the you know resources, communities, um, advocates, and social workers, mental health professionals, um, healthcare um, workers that interact with domestic and sexual violence survivors um, throughout their their day, their life course. Um, and so what we do is we provide support through trainings, webinars, technical assistance. Um, we have a 
24 hours, seven day a week domestic violence crisis line that we also run, and we um, can do safety planning, um, laps, you know, lethality assessment protocol um, for folks and survivors on that. So we're here to help. Um, if you, you know, would like to have a training or if you'd like to attend a training, get a hold of me, get a hold of us, and we can see how we can facilitate that. Oh, and of course, a little bit of who I am. You're gonna you're gonna hear my voice a little bit through this webinar, um, and most of you've probably heard my voice um, through the the other webinars that we've provided um, this year. So, I am the education and outreach coordinator. So basically, what that means is I'm over um, the majority of the education and training that the coalition offers. So I do webinars every two weeks, and we are um, going to have a a special um, webinar series also um, in the summer pertaining to human um, traffic um, traffic folks so human trafficking and that'll be really nice um, I have a educational history in psychology and women and gender studies it's really well with the work that we do here at the coalition I have about eight years of working with specifically LGBTQIA folks um, and other uh, underserved survivors of trauma um, and that includes all types of trauma um, from, you know, child abuse, from deaths in the family, from natural disasters, so on and so forth. These little pictures here, um, if you uh, look on the one on the left, uh, my hobby, so my self-care is Dungeons and Dragons, and a part of that is actually painting the little miniatures. So um, that's really good self-care, really good um, kind of escape for me, especially for the work that I do every day. It's, when you have to focus on a tiny little leather strap <laughs> on a little orc, um, it makes it really hard to think about the stuff that you may have experienced during the day. And of course, the picture on the right uh, is my sweet cat, um, Jorge and Torico. Jorge's on the top. He's 16 and Torico um, is three. So you may hear them meowing in the background during this webinar <laughs> because they like to be a part of it. All right, and last but definitely not least, I live in Ogden, Utah. I live right next to the mountains, and I love hiking. Um, I may not necessarily, you know, believe in, in you know, stuff much, but I definitely am afraid. <laughs> I know I should be more afraid of cougars and, and bears and stuff, but uh, this definitely has a little bit of a, <laughs> my fear attached to it. So, all right, and now I will let Mackenzie, or excuse me, Emily Mackenzie, um, introduce herself. All right, so I'm not as cool as Andy to put stuff on there. <laughs> um, but just a little bit about me. I've been an immigration lawyer for about nine years, but before that I interned for Alyssa Williams at Catholic Community Services, and she's been a great mentor to me. Um, definitely taught me to check my ego at the door when it comes to immigration. Before that, I attended the University of Utah, did my um, BS in Human Development and Family Studies, and then I got my JD from the University of Idaho in December of 2009, and then was admitted to the Utah Bar in 2010. Um, <clears throat> so I've been doing this for a while, and actually the whole reason why I went to law school was to do immigration. Um, I probably would not have survived law school <laughs> if I didn't have a goal in mind. So. Um, that's just a little bit about me professionally, but personally, I also have a cat, but he's kind of a jerk, but I still love him. <laughs> um, but a good example is that yesterday he decided to come into the house with a bird that I thought was dead, but it was not dead and it was alive and flew around my house for a while until I finally got it out. So that's my cat. He's not as calm as it seems like Andy's cats are. But, so that's about me. Um, I do feel like I have a little more experience with immigration law over knowing how to control my cat. So, yeah. All right, is this where I'm taking over? All right, let me, um, there we go. I can advance the slides for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is kind of, um, well, first off, I just wanted to say I normally, this is my first time doing a webinar. I've listened to a lot of webinars, but I've never presented at a webinar. So if I'm speaking too quickly, um, just reach out to Andy and say, hey, tell her to calm down, slow it down. Um, and I'm happy to do that. The other thing too, is if I'm using uh, terms that you're not familiar with, again, just let me know. These are terms that I use every day that I tend to forget might not be familiar to people who don't deal with immigration 
on a regular basis. So just reach out, let me know, and I'll um, change whatever I need to. So, all right. So we're going to talk about um, people who are victims of domestic violence or any sort of crime in general. But first, we kind of need to figure out what is an immigrant in general. So our objectives, we're going to define an immigrant, what the characteristics of the immigration population um, is in the U.S. and in Utah specifically. Um, sorry for those of you in Alabama, I don't know anything about that area, but I'm sure I could find it for you if you wanted. Um, and then the dynamics of domestic violence with the immigrant populations, what relief is po po possible for immigrant survivors, and how you um, and your professions and, and your jobs can help advocate for those immigrant survivors. You can go next. Okay, so I'm sure in the news you've heard terms immigrant, refugee, asylee, illegal, legal, undocumented, documented. We're going to try to talk about those. And again, if you have any questions, like Andy said, just pop them over there and um, I can answer them for you. So the first one we're going to talk about are immigrants. Um, this definition is kind of a funny one. So it's someone who uh, voluntarily leaves their country of origin. Generally, this falls into the category of people who are illegal, which is also, they are also called undocumented. As Im immigration attorneys and immigration advocates, we prefer to call them undocumented as opposed to illegal. Um, <clears throat> just because personally, we don't feel that people are illegal, we feel that they're just undocumented. And then it also is for people that are documented or entered illegally. Um, as far as voluntary leave in their country, a lot of people do because they have family here that help them come or they have work and they had a work visa, they're able to come that way. But a lot of them, sometimes it is involuntary because of issues that they're having in their country. Either it's unstable because of civil wars or drugs or issues with the government. Um, Venezuela at this point is a really great example of people that are involuntarily leaving their country because of the dangers. El Salvador is another one. Um, a refugee is another term for someone that is in a country that has been found to um, be in conflict. So people from Somalia, Sudan, Syria, Iraq, they are people that have been outside of the United States they fled their country due to civil war, famine, um, government uprisings, coups, anything like that. And they have been determined by the United Nations to be a political group of people that have been persecuted and they cannot return to their country. And so they're going to be resettled in a different country throughout the world. Um, the United States is one that was, <laughs> not currently, but was one of the bigger countries that took refugees in, um, but they'll continue to. Um, different administrations take whatever numbers that they determine that the country can handle. Asylees <clears throat> are like refugees. The only difference is that when they apply for their protections because of persecution, they do it inside of the United States instead of outside of the United States. So if someone comes from, say, uh, Syria and they come on a visitor visa and they get here and they say I need to apply for asylum because I'm being persecuted because I am part of this tribe and the Assad regime does not like me for example um, they would then apply for protections because they're being persecuted because they are of a particular group not everyone can get asylum you have to be a particular social group um, be persecuted because of your religion, gender, um, what's another one, race, political opinion. And so a lot of the time we see people from, for example, Mexico, they want to apply for asylum because of the cartels. They don't qualify for asylum under immigration law because the problems with the, car with the cartels is that they are terrorizing and persecuting everyone not because of their religion or not because they're 
um, a particular tribe. It's just something that's happening to everyone, so they're not being persecuted specifically for who they are. So that's the definition between immigrant refugee and asylee. Next one, please. Okay, we're gonna go more into refugees, like I mentioned. Um, again, they have to be determined to have been persecuted, again, because of their race, religion, nationality, and membership in a particular social group or political opinion. The group of people, which we'll talk about this more when we get to asylees, the group of people that um, from South America that have really been able to win are people from Venezuela and mostly for political opinion. Um, <clears throat> but that one can be difficult to prove depending on the country that you're in. So refugees from say Somalia, they're, they generally are being able to um, get refugee status because of the conflict in their country. Um, because Al-Shabaab is against the government and Al-Shabaab is saying you need to be a better religious person. And so that's kind of their situation. And it's too risky for them to return. The thing about refugees that I think people don't realize is that just because you are determined to be a refugee doesn't mean it's an automatic resettlement somewhere. A lot of refugees, especially in Africa, will spend years in a refugee camp. So we will see people coming from Sudan or Somalia that have been in a refugee camp for 15, 20 years, just waiting to come because of the backlog. But also for the US in particular, there's a lot of security um, checks that people need to go through. And so sometimes they'll finish one security check and then have to do another one through like, for example, the FBI. By the time the FBI is done, the previous one done by the CIA is now expired and they have to do that one again. So it's not a quick process and it's not easy. A lot of refugees also don't always get to choose where they go. The UN really tries to resettle people <clears throat> in areas where they at least know someone to help them assimilate into that culture of where they are. Okay, next one. All right, poll. All right, so we have a poll that will pop up here on your screen. And the question that uh, we'd like you to answer is, what are the top three countries of origin um, for refugees? All right, and so that should um, have opened on your screen. So go ahead and click one of those answers. Um, what you think um, is um, correct. All right, looks like we got about 27% of folks voted. Let's see if we get more folks voted. So we have um, four different options here. We have the Democratic Republic of the Congo, El Salvador, and Malaysia. Um, our second answer is Japan, Peru, and Costa Rica. Our third answer is South Sudan, Afghanistan, and Syria. And our fourth um, option is Turkey, Rwanda, and North Korea. All right, looks like we have a majority of folks voted. We'll get this um, closed out and shared. All right, so it looks like we had 7% um, who said um, the Democratic um, Republic of the Congo, El Salvador, and Malaysia. We had 7% um, say Japan, Peru, and Costa Rica. And then we had 86% um, of folks say South Sudan, um, Afghanistan, and Syria. All right. All right. Yep, you're correct. Those are the most, Syria definitely has um, gone down <laughs> currently with this administration, but those are, the biggest um, countries. The other ones I would say in Utah specifically would be Somalia as well. Uh, Minnesota is also a big area that has a, a lot of Somalis. Um, and then the other one would be here in, in Utah would be Bhutan and Burma, I think are the other ones too. Um, I mean, you know why North Korea wouldn't because, well, it's difficult to get in North Korea <laughs> in general. So. That's their biggest issues from uh, refugees. 
of it. Okay, so and like I mentioned with the Thiles, um currently from South America, the ones that are winning asylum cases are people from Venezuela um, because of the political issues that are going on there, and they have for a while. So I'm sure you've heard in the news of the people at the border from Honduras and El Salvador, they're trying to apply for asylum. Unfortunately for the majority of them, they're not going to win um, because they don't fall in one of those um, categories of race, political opinion, or anything like that. So it's a very specific group and it's not really easy to win asylum but people should still be given the opportunity to apply. Okay, so immigration populations. Um, higher poverty rates despite higher employment rates. I don't know how familiar you are with the immigrant populations with what you do, but the ones that I work with work like crazy um, and work a lot, but still are in those, those poverty ranges. Um, crime rates are lower, but they do tend to be um, incarcerated more. <laughs> I know that says the incarcerated one fourth rate of native born, but they tend to be, um, well, we could go into social reasons, but I won't. Anyway, we'll just move on. <laughs> they have lower rates of divorce, um, net decreases in immigrants entering the U.S. since 2008. That has been steadily decreasing despite what, um, things might have been what we might have heard, but yes, that has been decreasing. And a lot of that is because in the countries where people are coming from, economies are starting to grow a little more. And so they're able to stay in their own countries to increase their own um, economies. All right. All right, Utah estimated 245,294 immigrants in the US, one in 12 Utah residents are immigrants. One in 12 Utah residents are native born US citizens with at least immig one immigrant parent. 6% of children in Utah lived with at least one un undocumented family member in 2014. I think that sometimes Utah gets a rap of being predominantly white, which we still are. However, we do have a fairly large immigrant population, whether that be refugees, asylees, or documented and undocumented. Okay. 30% um, of immigrants had less than a high school diploma, over 40% had at least some college education, and 22% um, completed a college degree or more. 11% of the labor force are immigrants, and this might be interesting to people, <laughs> undocumented immigrants do pay taxes. Um, I get told a lot by people that immigrants don't pay taxes, they do, um, they have a tax ID number, which allows them to pay taxes. And actually, one of the first things that if, it, if someone is put into deportation um, court, that is the first thing that a, the immigration judge will ask is to see taxes. That's also the first thing that the um, USCIS officers will also see is if they pay taxes, because that shows a tie to the community. It shows that they are um, contributing to the economy. Um, immigrant little households had four billion in spending power in 2014, and immigrant owned businesses generated 453.1 million in income during 2015. I think one of the big things for people is to have their own business. Um, for some people that I have talked to, that was something that they never, ever, ever would have been able to do in their home country, and so to be able to have that here, is a really big thing and it contributes to our economy. So. <clears throat> All right, looks like we already have our um, second poll. So in this poll, um, what we would like you to answer is what country do the majority of U uh, Utah's um, immigrants um, originate from? So let's get this um, popped up and it should appear on your screen momentarily. All right, so um, we have five different options to choose from. Um, we have either the Philippines, Vietnam, um, Canada, El Salvador, or Mexico. So what do you think, um, which country do the majority of Utah's immigrants originate from? 
Looks like we got about half the folks voted so far. Dang, we're up to 75%. Gosh, a lot of folks are voting. Get a couple more folks uh, in there to vote, and then we can get this closed out. All right. Thank you, everyone. That was, that was some quick voting. All right, so let's get that shared. Okay, so it looks like we had 5% of folks say the Philippines, 0% said Vietnam, 5% said Canada, 19% um, said El Salvador, and 71% said New Mexico. Thank you, everyone, for um, participating in that. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, Mexico, obviously, <laughs> is the um, biggest country, and a lot of that is just because it's a pipeline right up right up to Utah. Um, and it was interesting, I, I have lived in the South, and for Florida and Tennessee, it was still Mexico, but a lot of those was Cuba for obvious reasons. Um, <clears throat> but Mexico... For them, it wasn't as prominent as Honduras or Guatemala, so it really just kind of depends on, on, on. Uh, so what they told me was the people that I met with would say that there'd be one person who would go and find a job and then tell someone else, and they would tell someone else and tell someone else. <laughs> so it's kind of how it works. The other thing about Utah with Vietnam is a lot of the people from Vietnam are people that came over after the Vietnam War, just like Utah, and and never left. So um, we are more diverse than I think we give ourselves credit for. So, all right. All right, so immigrant populations and domestic violence, I'm sure the majority of you have seen this power and control will before. Um, when it comes to immigrants, I feel the, what, the tools that are used are obviously different, but they, um, can be a lot more devastating. And when it comes to hurting someone more, not just physically, emotionally, but also separating someone from their children by um, deportation threats as well. So um, if we go through it, emotional abuse, uh, one of the big ones that we see is um, promising things like, um, I will do these, papers for you to get status only if you do this for me or um, they will say names and call call them racist names or they'll say things like um, I had a, I had a client who her US citizen husband would always call her um, in Spanish but in English his his little Mexican whore <laughs> like it was awful and and she just didn't know what to do or what to say or how to how to handle that um, economic abuse, not letting get job training or schooling. I see that a lot with um, not allowing the spouse to learn or partner to learn English because the person that learns English um, now has more control over their life because if they're not able to talk to the doctor or talk to the police in, in English, or if they're not able to even go to the grocery store or the um, post office, then that, that abuser has more control over them. Um, I saw that more often in the refugee community, how they wouldn't let their spouse take the driver's test or anything like that, because then they'd have to write, rely solely on their partner for everything. Um, That's really interesting, actually, um, Emily, and even think about how um, how folks have kind of spun that. And, you know, when folks see people who don't speak English, like, oh, why can't you learn you know, English? Why can't you just you know, do this? And when in reality, um, there might be a significant amount of power and control that's involved, especially if the person that they are married to or the person that they're um, partnered with is um, a citizen or um, have been naturalized so yeah very interesting yeah for sure because I had someone that wanted to do citizenship but her husband would not allow her to take the English test um, and to learn English and so because to become a citizen you have to be able to read write and speak English and he refused to let her take English classes um, 
and so, yeah, I think that's something that if we just automatically assume, um, well, they're just not learning English because they don't want to, you know, there might be something else that goes along with it. So, yeah. Um, sexual abuse, using children, I think is a big one. Um, I've seen clients that their spouses have told them, if you leave me, I will flee and leave and go back to our home country and you won't be able to see your kids. Um, threats, I'm going to call ICE. Um, I've also had people say, if you don't um, traffic yourself out, I will also call ICE, that kind of stuff. Using citizenship or residency as privilege. Well, I'm the US citizen and I have more rights than you. Um, intimidation, hiding documents and everything is a big one. And then obviously physical abuse is always a problem. So, so those I think are specifically more for the immigrant population that might not um, fall into categories of people who are citizens or already documented. Again, if there's any questions, please let me know. All right. We did have one um, quick question. Um, someone said, do you think that the divorce rates are correlated with lack of resources um, in their language somehow? Yes, it is definitely that. I think a lot of it is that people don't know how to deal with the system. Um, they have no idea how it works here in the U.S. I have also had clients where their abuser has told them they're not allowed to get a divorce. Only the man can file the divorce in the U.S and women are not allowed to file divorces here. So I have seen that. I've also seen that they feel no one will help them because they um, don't speak English. Um, it's just navigating the system, I think, more than anything. But the other thing I've seen is that um, there's a stigma with filing for a divorce for some cultures, which I think is difficult to overcome as well. I mean, I've, I, I have friends too that they um, have been told they were in an abusive relationship and they've been told, well, I dealt with it, so you should too, kind of a thing. And um, I think it's that stigma too. Okay. Um, so these are, uh, you know, the things that I was going through, things that go on. Isolation is a really big one especially if the person's family is not in the United States or not in the state of where they live. It's difficult for people to be in contact with them and it's a lot easier for their abuser to isolate them. But again, that goes to the isolation of the abuser not allowing them to drive themselves or even learn how to take care of themselves without them. So they rely solely on them. All right. Okay, emotional abuse, lying about the victim's immigration status, telling lies to the victim's family, using racist names, belittling them, um, accusing them of becoming white or American. I see that a lot um, within certain cultures, yeah. Um, not allowing them to see sick or dying relatives. I had that with one client, and then when the relative died, they blamed them for it. So that was fun. Um, and then lying about, I had this, this one is definitely mine. I had someone who told the victim that they were a U.S. citizen and then they would help them file paperwork if they just got married and then they got married, they were abused. And it turned out that person was actually, the perpetrator was actually undocumented as well. So, <laughs> okay, next. Economic abuse, forcing them to work illegally. Um, which has actually become a huge problem with immigration lately. Um, immigration is really investigating how people are working. Um, threatening to revert, um, report the person to ICE, which is actually a very interesting thing because you can report stuff to ICE all you want, but it's completely up to ICE on if ICE actually wants to investigate. Um, from what I've seen, they very rarely do because they have a lot of other things that they have to do. Not letting them get job training or schooling, again, uh, ESL classes. Taking money that is intended for the family back home. Big one, forcing victims to sign papers in English that they didn't understand. This happened to a father and son. The father came to me and said that his son wanted him to sign 
this paper to, I think it was, what the son told him it was just um, basically a protection for the father if something happened to the father. But what actually happened was that the son tricked the father into signing away his home and gave the home to the son. And the son then kicked the father out of the house. So um, that's the big one. And then, um, uh, yeah, harassing the victim that the only job they can have legally. The other thing with the economic abuse is I have seen people that have been forced into sex trafficking as well because of the inability to work legally. All right, next. Sexual abuse, calling them a prostitute or a mail order bride. Um, this is a big one, accusing them of trying to attract other people if they look at someone else or if they wear makeup. Um, I think this is one that you, you see in all issues of domestic violence, that people get jealous, um, regardless of if they're immigrants or not. Alleging that they're, they have a history of prostitution, and this is another one, that the United States says that they are required to have sex with their partner until they're divorced, but I'd also have them say even after divorce they are required to because um, that is the job of the woman. I have seen that one before. All right, next. Coercion and threats. Again, reporting to ICE. Um, I think this is a big one. If you have a, a client who said that they're really worried about being reported to ICE, ICE does have a duty to at least see if that claim is valid. Just by someone calling and saying, my neighbor is here illegally, they're not going to do anything about that. They have way too much to do to really investigate a claim like that. And so I feel like if a person is worried about that, they should not be too worried. If it does happen though, there are things that they can do to be protected as well. And they can always have a claim to stay, so. Um, I've had someone threatening that they will not file immigration papers. This was someone that um, a client said that they would not file paperwork for them until the woman gave him a son. She never did, because she kept having daughters apparently, and. It just made him mad. Um, threatening to withdraw the petition. That happens a lot. Threatening to say, I'm going to write immigration and tell them that you lied to me and it was a fraudulent marriage. Harm the victim's family and harass coworkers. Okay, next. All right, using children. They're going to take their children. Um, this one, I, have, I had a client whose husband took their children to a country in the Middle East and because of the laws there, it was not allowed to get her children back. Um, and I mean, thankfully she was able to eventually, but she was told by him that the only way she would get her kids back was if she, I don't remember exactly what she did, but she had to pay some crazy amount of money. And so um, she was, he told her that because she only had a green card, that she couldn't use the U.S. Embassy for help um, to get her kids back, but her kids were U.S. children, U.S. citizens. So they're going to use whatever they need to to um, intimidate and use the children. And whether it be man, woman, whoever, I mean, kids are going to be a huge reason why people stay in relationships, obviously. So, okay. Citizenship or residency privilege. Um, I just want to clarify really quick in case anyone's wondering. The steps to immigration is your first step you, is you have to become a resident, a legal permanent resident, or as we call it, a green card. You have to have that first for a certain amount of time, and then you can apply for U.S. citizenship. Um, a green card can be taken away if they found you committed fraud at any point during the green card application stage, 
or you are outside of the United States for too long, um, or you committed a crime after getting your green card and a judge takes away that green card. So if someone has a green card and it expires, that doesn't mean that they, they're no longer a green card holder, that just means they need to apply for a new one. And then when they become a citizen, that citizenship can never be taken away. Um, the only way it could ever be taken away is again, if the person committed fraud to get that citizenship or the person renounces the citizenship at any point. So I just wanted to clarify that because I have a lot of people that come in and say, I want to be a citizen and then I ask to see their green card and they don't have that yet. Can you um, elaborate a little bit more on what does it legally mean to renounce your citizenship? So to renounce your citizenship, I don't know if anyone is familiar, but sometimes, so lately, at least the past couple, five, 10 years, people have been giving up their US citizenship because they don't want to have to pay US taxes when they live overseas, when they're an expat. Um, so what you have to do is you have to actually go to a US embassy and sign a paper where you say, I am no longer a US citizen. Um, <clears throat> and you are giving up all of your rights and privileges of a US citizen. It's not really easy to do. And once you do it, you're done. Like it, you're, there's nothing you can do to get it back unless you go through the whole stage again where someone does a petition for you, you become a green card holder, you file for citizenship later. But if you renounce to your citizenship because you don't want to have to pay US taxes, you're never going to get citizenship ever again. So it's kind of a big deal for people to do that. And it's not easy. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So failing to file papers to legalize victims' immigration status, um, withdrawing or threatening to withdraw immigration papers, controlling the victim's ability to work. Uh, I had a client who got her, got his work permit and his um, wife refused to give him the card so he could work. Um, using the victim's undocumented immigration status to keep them from reporting abuse or leaving with the children. I'm sure some of you have heard that, that the police, that the person has been told the police won't believe them because they're undocumented, um, which is the next one. <laughs> and that the, if they do call the police, the police will then call ICE, which technically they could if they wanted, but I have yet to hear any police department doing that for a victim. I have heard them doing that for a perpetrator, but not for a victim, which I really hope stays that way because forget anyone ever calling the police if they start calling ICE on victims. So, all right, next. All right, and we had a, a question. Someone asked, um, how long can you be out of the United States without losing your green card? So the rule is, um, Technically, if you ever want to apply for citizenship, it has to be less than six months um, within a five-year period. If you don't care about citizenship, you cannot be gone longer than one year. If you're gone longer than one year, you'd have to go to the embassy and ask them for a re-entry permit to return to the United States, but you'd have to prove to them that you did not abandon your residency meaning you still paid taxes, you still had a house here, you still had family here, you still had a job here, that kind of stuff. Even then, if you didn't file that and you were gone for longer than a year and you show up at the border, the Customs and Border Protection Officer can say, well, you were gone for too long, so you need to go talk to an immigration judge. And at that point, you could try to prove to the immigration judge you did not abandon your status. But I tell everyone, less than a year, just do it less than a year. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes what people can do, um, like if you have a surgery and there's an emergency and there's just nothing you can do, if you can prove to the Border Patrol agent or the embassy that the reason why you're out was something that was beyond your control, then they usually will grant that re-entry permit, re permit. For example, I had a client who um, she was visiting her family and got hit by a car and had to be in the hospital and was in a coma for a year. And so the embassy was granted her a reentry permit because she was there for two years, but she was in a coma for a year. That, 
And so they, they granted her that. So it just, it depends on the situation, but if someone's out just because they're just hanging out, it's gonna be a lot harder to come back. So, okay. Intimidation, hiding or destroying important papers, um, destroying the only property the victim brought with them. Um, I've seen people where they have had their family photos burned and anything like that. Um, threatening persons who serve as a source of support for the victim, family, met mom, dad, brothers, sisters being threatened. Um, <clears throat> I have, and you know, this one I think is again, will apply to immigrant populations and non-immigrant populations, threatening to say or do something that will shame them, um, you know, threatening to publish nude photos or anything like that, family secrets and stuff like that. Isolation is isolating from friends and family. Again, I think these apply to immigrant and non-immigrant um, in some ways, but other ways, I think it's easier to isolate someone who's an immigrant when they are separated from their family if the family's in another country, not allowing them to learn English like I had mentioned before. Um, the other one is not allowing them to speak their native language. Like if they're on the phone, um, they get mad if they're speaking their native language to their family member. <clears throat> and then being the only person with whom they can communicate. This one is especially prominent in cultures or communities that the language is so rare that they only have one or two people that can help them out. Reading their mail, um, having to listen into phone calls or not letting them use the phone, not letting them go to the store by themselves. Um, they won't let them go to meetings by themselves. I will have people that have that want to have a consultation with me, but the partner refuses to let them meet with me by themselves. And so then I, at that point, have to be a little forceful and say it's attorney-client privilege and they're not allowed in and it can get ugly. Um, not allowing them to have connections with their home country, right? Not getting their favorite television, television stations from where they're from or their um, like newspapers um, or going to cultural events or anything. All right. Minimizing, denying and blaming. Convincing them that violent actions are not criminal unless they occur in public. Um, Telling them the victim is allowed to physically punish them because he's the man. Blaming the victim for the breakup of the family. Telling the victim that they are responsible for the violence. These are huge. <laughs> uh, I think this one is a, is a difficult one for me because I feel that sometimes, especially when it comes to women in certain cultures, that the enforcement of this thinking is perpetuated by other women. Like I mentioned, a friend of mine who left a, an abusive relationship and her mom was disappointed in her because her mom put up with it, so why didn't she? Um, I think that that makes it difficult for people to leave a relationship because of cultural norms that this is how it is. This is how it's always been. Your grandma went through it. Your aunts went through it. Why can't you handle it? That kind of a thing. Um, blaming them for the breakup. And then um, why don't you just do what I told you to? And then I wouldn't have done that to you. I think that's a, that's a big one. And again, I think that's one that goes with immigrant population and, with, and outside as well. Okay, this is a great question. Fewer immigrants are reporting domestic violence to authorities. Why? I want you to answer that if you'd be willing. Why um, do you think that fewer immigrants are reporting domestic violence to authorities? So go ahead and type, why do you think this is happening in that, that question box? Why do you think it's happening? All right, so someone said that they're scared of deportation. A couple folks just chimed in with deportation. Um, growing culture of xenophobia and fear of authorities. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, fear of deportation not being believed. Yeah, think about how even survivors in general are not believed. And then when we have this um, um, intersection of, of 
um, immigration, um, race, and identity, it just increases that. Yeah, and I think the, the the hard part with the immigrant population in particular is the reason why a lot of them aren't reporting domestic violence is because in a lot of their countries, it's not a crime. Um, so for example, when we went way back at the beginning of this, we talked about asylees and refugees. Um, at one point, there was case law that said that if you were an abused wife from Guatemala or Mexico or whatever, and you reported that abuse to the police and the police did nothing for you, you were eligible for asylum because you were a particular social group that the government refused to protect. Um, Sessions, unfortunately, when he was attorney general, came in and as attorney general, because immigration is civil and not criminal law, um, the attorney general has the right to take any case that they want and review it and make a ruling on it. And only the Supreme Court can overrule those cases that he takes. So he took a case and said, nope, I don't feel like they warrant asylum because what happens in a, a private setting stays in a private setting. So, unfortunately, <laughs> women are no longer winning based on that. But I think that's part of it is that the governments of countries where they're from, they're just not crimes. And so they don't think that they have a right to report that. I do think some countries are trying to change that, but I don't, it's gonna take a while for sure. But I mean, fear of deportation is always one, definitely. Fear of losing your family, fear of being a failure. I've been told that, that they're a failure as a wife, they're a failure as a husband, that men aren't abused. That's just not what happens to men, right? So it's a lot of stigma too. Yeah, nice. And we had a couple of people um, even chime in that cultural stigma, like you were saying, unable yeah. to communicate well in English. Um, yeah, simply because they don't know how to do it and they don't realize that it's um, domestic violence. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. What should you know as an advocate? So these are questions I think that are great for you to ask yourself and to ask your staff. How does the victim's residency status affect their access to service? to services, does it? It shouldn't, right? Should have no bearing on if they're eligible to receive any services. Obviously, at some point they do. For example, if you're undocumented, you're not eligible for food stamps, you're not el eligible for Medicaid, you're not eligible for housing. But are you eligible for shelter? Yes. Are you eligible for therapy care? Yes. Are, your US, are there US citizen children eligible for food stamps? Yes, right? Um, and so there are some times when status does affect services, but in general, no. <laughs> um, what should an advocate do if ICE calls or comes to the door and where can I go for additional help? So I think we're gonna go through these. All right, what if a victim is not a US citizen? If a victim has a green card or visa, um, help them get immediate needs and then contact a legal expert or help to connect with ex existing legal aid. Um, if so, someone comes to you and they say, I've been abused and I have a green card and I don't know what to do, you know, and then at that point you get to say, okay, what do we need? Do we need to help you with shelter? Do we need to help you um, with your kids? Do we need to help figure that out? And do you have a current attorney to help you with your protective order, et cetera, right? <clears throat> if they don't have anything, then they do need to contact an immigration attorney as soon as possible. But at the same time, that same victim who's not a citizen or they don't have a visa or a green card also needs to have access to someone that can help them with the protective order or a divorce. All right, <clears throat> legal status should not affect the victim's access to services. Providing services for individuals does not affect your funding regardless of their legal status. Um, there are relief options for victims who may not have legal residency and ICE should be treated like any other law enforcement agency with any victim. Um, like I was mentioning before, if someone shows up to shelter and needs help, 
their status shouldn't have any difference on if you should help them or not. Um, applying for certain benefits can affect it, but you looking to see if they qualify shouldn't affect it or anything like that. Um, and again, ICE doesn't have a right to come into your shelter, into your business. They need to be treated just like other law enforcement. Okay, relief for survivors. So Congress has a couple of different things that they created and I think it was the early 2000s um, when they decided that they really needed help victims of crime, particularly domestic violence. So the first one is the Violence Against Women Act, here we call VAWA. Um, VAWA is specifically for domestic violence, no other crime, just domestic violence. You, non-immigrant status for victims of crimes, that's domestic violence and a lot of other crimes, which we'll go into. And then T, non-immigrant status for victims of human trafficking, and that's sex trafficking, labor trafficking as well. And we'll go into them. All right. <clears throat> Oh, and the other ones that's on Harris Island, we talked about the, the SIJS at the bottom. These are, it's, it's called Special Immigrant Juvenile Status. Um, these are for kids that have either been abused, abandoned, or neglected by their parents. Um, lately, there's been an upswing in that of kids showing up at the border, which I'm sure you've heard on the news of them being held in camps. Um, a lot of those kids are going to be applying for unaccompanied minor status or special immigrant juvenile status. Um, they do have to prove that they've been abandoned, neglected, or abused by their parents, or they're an orphan. Um, those kids tend to have to go through the um, juvenile or family court system to have a guardian first, and then they're able to get um, an SIJ visa, and then eventually a green card. The thing about the SIJ uh, kids is that they are never ever allowed to petition for their parents. <clears throat> They're completely banned from pe petitioning parents. Um, and so a lot of kids when they're young think that they, even though they are abused or neglected or abandoned by their parents, think that they still want to help their parents out. So they decide not to do it, which is unfortunate because then sometimes they don't have any other option, but it does protect them. And it is age specific. Um, but then we're going to talk about the rest of them. Specifically. Okay, so asylum we mentioned, T visas, VAWA, and U visas, what we're really going to go into now. Okay. All right, so um, have any of you worked with survivors on any of these visas? Um, I'm going to get a poll popped up here in just one second, and um, let's see. So you can select multiple um, options on this poll. So which one of these um, visas have you worked on um, with survivors? So remember, you can click multiple um, options here. So which one of these? The first option is U visa. The section, second option is T visa. The third option is the VAWA visa. And the fourth option is none of these. Got about 68% of folks voted. We'll get a couple more um, folks voted and then we'll get this closed out. All right. So it looks like we had 23% of folks say they have worked with someone um, with a U visa, 0% on a T visa, 15% of folks have worked um, with survivors on a VAWA visa. And it looks like 69% of folks um, have not worked on um, one of these visas with a survivor. All right, so this is gonna be a great lesson, I think, for a lot of us. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna talk about U visas currently. And I'm gonna talk about kind of the distinction between all of them. Um, T visas are kind of a, they're very rare. I think a lot of that is because people don't know how to use them. But we'll go into that. So U visas, victim of a qualifying crime, and the key word there is qualifying. So not every crime qualifies. Um, substantial mental or physical abuse, 
and they were helpful to law enforcement to a law enforcement agency. Police, prosecutor, judge, or other. The other can include like the Department of Labor if they're a victim of labor violations. Um, there's discretionary factors and derivative family members, which means they can bring in other family members in their case. All right, so here's the list of qualifying crimes. The big thing about these crimes is they had to have happened in the United States. Um, so if any of this happened outside of the United States, you don't qualify for a U. <clears throat> um, so the other thing that I want you to notice is it says other related crimes at the very bottom. Um, I have yet to be able to get a U visa under that. <laughs> Uh, generally, the USCIS will not grant a U if it falls under that category, and law enforcement agencies are very reluctant to do a certification if it doesn't fall into one of these qualifying crimes that are on this list here. Um, the biggest one that we see is domestic violence, for sure. <clears throat> um, the other thing about that list, if you go back really quick, Andy. Sorry. Okay. The other one is the felonious assault. We will have a lot of people that come in and want to get a U visa based on the fact that they got in an argument with their neighbor and they both slapped each other. Um, not assault. Felonious or in Utah, it's called aggravated assault. Um, there has to be more of an element to the assault besides we both smacked each other in the face. It was he used a tree limb and hit me upside the head kind of a thing. He used a weapon. Um, so that's kind of the thing where we have people that they just assume because I got punched in the nose that I get a, a U visa and you just don't. Okay. All right, substantial mental or physical abuse. The bar is not really that high. It's true, like it says. Um, basically what you do, if you can submit photos, if you can submit police reports, um, uh, a big one is therapist letters. That's one we really like to get are from therapy that shows that they are they were in therapy or they're still in therapy and they have been diagnosed with something. But again, they're not required to be diagnosed with something. Um, but oftentimes victims of a crime do tend to get diagnosed with something because they've been through a lot of trauma. So what you can do as an advocate is to help them connect to someone that can help them um, get that therapy even if it's not for the u visa just for their own will well-being having them connect with someone that can help them with therapy or counseling i think is extremely important the other thing too that would be great with advocates is to help them get that police report and to help them speak with the um, police departments especially if the person is a little worried about not being able to communicate well in english Okay, so this is a big one, <laughs> especially now. Um, U visas were, were usually fairly straightforward. Um, I say that with some reserve because they used to, used to be able to say, yep, I had this issue, but please forgive me and here's proof that I'm a good person. But now immigration is saying, ah, we still don't think you're a good person, so give us even more stuff. And so it's kind of a new area for us as well um, to figure out exactly what immigration is looking for when it comes to discretionary factors. Basically, when you file for a U visa, you have to show that you're a good person um, along with being a victim. So pros that can help out your case. You've been here for a really long time. You have family who's US citizens or permanent residents you don't have a criminal history, you have volunteer work, or you do have a long history of working in the United States, just not as a US citizen, because that's kind of a big thing. Um, completed certain programs, your kids have completed programs, um, you've continuously paid taxes is a really good one too. Um, good contributing member, church goer, community member goer, <laughs> I say that, but um because what you have to outweigh is if you do have any cons if you go to the next one 
um, is you have to kind of have a scale. And if you have some cons, you have to outweigh those cons by some pretty big positives. So if you have a criminal history, drug offenses, repetitive issues, um, there's a really good chance. So when the when we talk about discretionary factors, that means the immigration gets to look at your case and say, no, we don't want to give it to you because we don't think that you warrant discretion, that you warrant a favor favorable finding that you're a good person, that you deserve to stay here. Um, and so if you have something like a drug offense, then it can be a problem. Now, when it comes to drug offenses, it, we've kind of hit a weird little crossroads with state marijuana laws and federal marijuana laws. Um, I recently attended a meeting with the local USCIS office and their field office director and the Denver field office director who's in charge of the Salt Lake office. And they told us that federal law will always trump state law, always, um, no pun intended, but <laughs> will always overrule state law. And so if Colorado has recreational marijuana. Um, federal law will always find it to be illegal. If, but that's only going to be a problem if someone has ever been arrested or convicted or they did a, an immigration required medical exam and it came back positive for drugs then at that point, they're gonna have a problem with immigration. So with marijuana, you're allowed to have one single offense for marijuana if it's less than 30 grams, basically for personal use. Um, so if you have someone who's on medical marijuana, prescribed by a doctor, allowed in their state, immigration will deny their application because they're gonna say they're a drug addict or abuser because federal law will trump that state law. So it's really kind of an interesting thing we're dealing with right now. But what you have to do if you have something like that is you gotta do those pros to outweigh that con that you might have. Okay, other issues, um, <clears throat> immigration violations, did you use fraudulent documents? How many times did you come in illegally? Did you ever claim to be a US citizen? Those are kind of a big one. Um, so uh, as far as criminal history goes, if you have a sex offense of a minor or child abuse, you will not be approved a U visa, no matter how much evidence you give of rehabilitation or anything like that, even if, the child abuse charge or neglect or endangerment that you were convicted of was, I left my kids in the car for two seconds while I ran into the store, you're done. There's just nothing that we can do to outweigh that negative factor with those. Other ones, we can sometimes beef up that application with positive things, but those ones we're finding are the ones that you're just not gonna win. Um, multiple drug offenses, if it's not marijuana, cocaine, heroin, drug trafficking is a huge one. Violations of a protective order is a big one that you're not going to win either. So, but yeah, it's to illustrate what US is looking for, USCIS is looking for. Um, but yes, as an advocate, <laughs> if someone asks you, do you think I'll get approved? J yeah, just say you need to go talk to this attorney because it it's like waves in a sea. Sometimes everything's fine, sometimes everything's bad. So. Um, just don't tell them anything because sometimes that could be akin to legal advice and you don't want to do that. But any questions, just let me know. Okay. This is the fun part about the U visa. So Congress has designated that there will be 10,000 visas available every year. The fiscal year starts in, in October. Um, USCIS is receiving approximately 40,000 applications each year, each year, but that actually has changed more like 60 to 80,000. So there's a huge backlog and current processing times is not five years. <laughs> You're looking at more like 12, 12 years. Um, 
Yes, and they do need to keep their address up to date. The reason why, the Trump administration has said that if, if we deny your application, all cases that are denied are now being referred to deportation court. Before, what they used to do if you were denied, they would let you just kind of hang out, and then if you're able to reapply again, they would let you do that. But now they're saying everyone gets to go to deportation court. If they don't have a current address for you, and they send the notice to appear to uh, immigration court to an old address and you don't show up, you don't get to claim or say you never received that notice because it was your job to update your address. So you just wanna make sure people know that they need to keep their address on file or if they go through an agency like Catholic Community Services or Holy Cross Ministries, that they keep that address current with those agencies as well. But current processing times for U visas, the fun part <clears throat> about that is that, yes, it's 12 years. The five years, I would say, is more for the deferred action. So what's going to happen is someone's going to send their U visa to the Vermont Service Center. Vermont's going to put it in the line. And then in about five years, they're going to get to it. And then they're going to look at it and say, well, we think this person qualifies for a U visa but there's not a visa available, right? Because there's only 10,000 available every year. Because there's not a visa available, we're gonna let you go into deferred action status, it's called, and so you can get a work permit that you have to renew every year. Um, and then once there's a visa available in six years, we will then send you your um, U visa with a new work permit that's good for four years. You have to have that U visa for three years and then you can apply for a green card. So it's, it's, a, it's a long wait for people, unfortunately. All right, expected to grow to seven years, like I said, more like 12. Um, deferred action status, more like five. <laughs> But yeah, it gives you a work permit and your family members. The big thing about the derivative family members is it's anyone, um, children, spouse, parents, if the child was unmarried and under 21 and they were the principal victim. And, and if the child was, so the child can either be the principal victim and file the U visa and mom and dad can be the derivative, or the child can be the principal victim and mom and dad can be the U visa principal because they're mom and dad of the child. Sorry, that was a little confusing, but basically you can bring family members in, but not, and brothers and sisters, if they're under 21 or under 18, sorry, um, and unmarried, but you can't bring like grandma, grandpa, cousins, aunts, and uncles. All uh, right. Um, you get the I-94 in the work permit, sorry. Go back on. <laughs> and then, um, yes, but your attorney should know if there's any changes because if you bring in a spouse and then you get divorced, that's going to affect the spouse's ability to get a green card later on in the future. But the kids' ages, just so you know, once you file it, their their age freezes as soon as you file. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, so this is the big one. This is for the police to sign. This is the um, supplement B. This is what the police have to fill out to um, certify that a crime actually happened. So basically they look at it and they say, was the person a victim? Yes. Of a qualifying crime? Yes. Were they helpful? Yes. That's it. The police don't get to decide if the person gets a U visa. All they get to decide is the person is a victim of a qualifying crime and were they helpful? That's it. A lot of the time we have police agencies that think that them filling out this form automatically means the person gets a U visa. It doesn't. So if you have police departments that are worried about that, you can explain that to them that nope, they don't, they aren't making that decision USCIS is. All right. So yeah, this is that form. Okay. So one more thing with the U visa, when you apply for the green card on the U visa, you have to get a new supplement B because the person has to prove that they have still been helpful um, during those three years in U visa status. So they have to get an updated one. Okay. 
All right, VAWA. So VAWA is for people that were married to a US citizen or a permanent resident. Um, they have to show that they're a person of good moral character and they don't have big problems with the police, uh, criminal issues. Subject to extreme, extreme cruelty, they don't have to have a police report of uh, domestic violence because you can support that by other stuff like therapist letters, photos, letters from family members or friends that have seen the abuse happen. Um, and if it's through an, um, if they do get divorced, you have to file that VAWA packet within two years of them getting divorced. And they have to show that they got married for love and not because they wanted the VAWA. Okay. Okay. So the VAWA, you're going to file the I-360 self-petition. With the I-360 self-petition, you um, get a prima facie determination letter, which says that you're eligible to get housing, food stamps, and everything in Utah because of how the Medicaid is set up. Most people actually don't get any benefits, but in other states, you can get benefits. Um, but then after that, you'd file for the green card. For a lot of people, we actually do these together. It's called a one step. We file the self-petition and the green card together. But the green card won't be um, approved until the, the, the VAWA petition is approved. Like, like U visas, um, if the person is a US citizen. If they are a permanent resident, then you have to go to, it's called the visa bulletin, and they have to wait for their priority date, depending on the country that they're from, and most of them are about two years wait time. So, okay. We kind of sped through these, but um, if you have questions, let me know. Okay. Um, so this one is kind of true. You do file it separately. However, if you're filing them together, I 360 and the 45, you both send you send them both to the Vermont Service Center. If you're doing just the I 360, you send that, wait for that to get approved, and then you file the I 45. Um, with the local office, there's always an interview with VAWA. U visas aren't interviewed. VAWA generally they always are, um, but again, they're not allowed. Like it says on there that it's strictly to determine admissibility. They're not allowed to ask anything about the abuse. If they are, me as an attorney, I get to call in the supervisor and the person gets, the officer gets in trouble. <laughs> um, but if you file them together, generally Vermont approves I-360 and then they ship it to Salt Lake and then they do the um, green card. They are about 14 months. I would say they're more about 24 right now. Um, if you're doing the I-360 by itself, it's probably about 14 months, but together about 24 months. Um, and like I mentioned, it's the Prima Fasci one and it lets people get a work permit. All right. T visa. T visas are people that are um, victims of trafficking. Um, so again, they this is a lot like the U visa. The only difference is, is it it's people that are victims of trafficking and not victims of a crime. So they have to be willing to assist in investigation or prosecution. Um, you can get a waiver of that if the child, if it's a child, um, or if you could show that there's so much trauma that they can't help like testify in anything. And you do have to show extreme hardship if you were removed. I did have a T visa case where someone, um, the trafficking happened outside of the United States and then they came into the United States, but they are assisting the FBI in the investigation. And so they were willing to sign the T visa certification on that. So T visas can happen outside, but it's very rare. Usually they, they, the trafficking needs to happen inside the U S. Okay. Next. All right. Same thing with T's and U's, it's a four year thing. After three years, you can apply for um, a green card and you can apply for um, certain family members. Obviously you can't apply for this family member that was trafficking you if that's the case. And again, the trafficking can be sex trafficking or labor trafficking. Utah and Idaho tend to have a problem with trafficking people from Peru to do sheep herding. Um, that's kind of a big issue in our two states. Um, there is an attorney that was working for Utah Legal Services that has done a ton of those cases for um, sheep herders. So they also can get a work permit. 
for the four years, uh, again, apply for a work permit or a green card after three. All right, next. Okay, uh, any questions on T visas? Just let me know. Um, T visas, I think a big one is people often think of sex trafficking, but it's labor trafficking. Um, there have been cases throughout the US of people that were trafficked to do sushi, like sushi chef. That's a sushi, sushi, that's a hard word to say. <laughs> so basically what you're looking for is if the person If they've lost their right to All right, we might be having just a little bit of uh, technical difficulties here for a sec. We'll see if we can get um, um, oh, Emily sorry. audio to come back here. Well, we may have lost Emily. Let's see if we can um, get her back. Sorry for that, folks. You know, I can, uh, oh, there I we go. Oh, okay. I can hear you. I just didn't know if you could hear me. There we go. Yep. We Now we hear you great. Now we hear you great. Okay. Sorry. I don't know what happened. Are we good? Yeah. And actually, I got a question oh. um, as well, too. I got a question. It says, if the victim was arrested for defending themselves, do they still qualify for a VAWA visa? That's a great question. Yes. So um, I actually just filed the vowel with someone who had the same thing. What it's going to depend on what is what the conviction was. So if they were convicted of domestic violence assault, you're going to have a harder time winning that. But if they were convicted of, say, disorderly conduct, then you have a better chance of winning. Um, but if they were just arrested for it, then you're usually okay. It just depends on what, if they were convicted of something. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this one we'll just go over really quickly. This gender-based asylum, that was the one that I was talking about. If they were a victim of um, domestic violence in another country and they applied for asylum, this is the one that Jeff Sessions took and has completely changed this and uh, is no longer well, it's currently not really winning in immigration court at this point, but I do know there are attorneys that are trying to play with it a little bit and switch it a little bit from what he determined to see if they can continue using this as a political, as a particular social group. So. All right, this, yeah, so this is the one. June 11th, 2018, that's what he's saying, it's a private criminal activity. It, yeah, that was a rough one for us to lose. <laughs> All right. Fear in the community. I think that this uh, was one that everyone was worried about um, since the election. Um, and I think as advocates, we have a duty to let people know that in general, I do feel that the police, not necessarily ICE, but I do feel that the police are really worried about people and they don't care about their status. They really just want to take care of the community. So I think that we have a duty to help people understand that. All right, what do you do if ICE comes? Stop and breathe. Again, we're treating them just like the police. All right, next. All right, this is our last um, poll for today's webinar. Um, if you could just answer this question that will pop up on your screen momentarily. All right. Has your organization ever interacted um, with ICE? All right. So our um, options are yes, um, no, and the third option is unsure. Let's see if we can get a bunch of folks voted. We'll get that closed out here in just a second.
All right. So it looks like 15% um, said yes, 31% said no, and then 54% of folks said they are unsure. Um, thank you, everyone, for filling that poll out. All right. Okay. So if you, uh, you might be unsure if it's ice, they generally they have to identify themselves, um, just like any other police department um, or law enforcement agency. So if they come to the door or they come to the shelter and they say, hey, tell me if this person is here, you get to say, I can't disclose that information due to our privacy policy and privacy laws. Um, I said, well, can you just tell me if this person is contacted? Again, you say, mm, I can't tell you, please contact my supervisor. Right? If you're the supervisor and you say, per our policy, which I'll give you a copy of, we cannot give you that information. And then don't let them in. They're not allowed to enter without a warrant. <laughs> and I actually have a really good um, template that folks can use um, to give to law enforcement, including ICE, about um, kind of explaining um, a little bit of VAWA confidentiality and that if you um, do receive VAWA um, funding, um, your confidentiality federal requirements and also um, your, um, your your want and your, your need to be able to have a good relationship with um, law enforcement. So I can um, also get that shared with folks. Okay, ask what they want. If they say, I wanna come in and look for this person, you say, where's your warrant? Is it signed by a judge? If they don't have a warrant, say, come back with a warrant. Um, if they say, I have a warrant and they flash you this paper, say, please let me read it. Um, and if you read it and it's a warrant, sure, but if it's not signed by a judge, that's not a legal document, which I think we're gonna show you some examples of here. All right, this is a warrant. I have had ICE show people this paper that has someone's photo in the corner. Um, that's not a warrant. That's ICE's um, like rap sheet where they say, this is the person that we want, this is their photo, their name, their birthday, and everything like that. This is a warrant, so you know what to look for. And again, it has to be signed. If at any point the warrant has an incorrect name, you can tell them this is incorrect and still deny them entry, which in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about what you can and can't do with ICE, but the big thing is you cannot delay them to allow the person to escape. That will help you lose funds quicker than anything else. So don't do that. All right, so if they do have it, ask them to wait, contact your supervisor, contact the person, um, let them know that the person is here for them, and then tell them to contact an attorney and then tell ICE to wait outside and the person will come out to them. Do not let ICE enter unless they have a warrant specifically to look inside. If they don't have anything to go inside the building, you don't have to let them in. If they're looking for a person and they have a warrant for a person, you can say they will be out front or they will come around to the back or they'll be on the corner, but you don't have to let them in. And this is really scary, especially when law enforcement does come to um, your um, organization and says, hey, we need to search, we need to do this. And it can be really jarring to sit and read a legal document. Um, but you do, like you were saying, you do have the right to um, look at it and make sure that um, you're following what the warrant says. Yes. So if the warrant says we have a right to search this person's room, for example, if it says we're searching this person's room and they venture off into the bathroom, you get to say that's not what the warrant says. If they ignore you, I would pull out my little cell phone and, and just film them because that is outside their warrant and whatever they find, they don't get to use. It's scary to do. It's absolutely terrifying, but you have a right to do that. All right. Ask for them to wait, contact your supervisor again. And for if they're asking for records in particular, that warrant better be super clear on what records they want. 
if they say we want records of when the person came, then you just give them a little intake sheet and you redact the hell out of everything else. Like they don't get to see everything. It has to be very specific. Okay. The fun part, resources, where do you go for help? So these are the fun things. Currently, kind of weird, I'm working for Catholic Community Services and Holy Cross Ministries. <laughs> Um, after June 12th, I will be only Catholic Community Services, but you can contact me in either of those places for now. Um, I'm happy to answer any of the questions. Um, Utah Domestic Violence Coalition and Immigrant Legal Services are all great resources as well, which obviously Andy's amazing, so you can talk to those guys too. You are very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and in the PDF that I will get, um, it looks like I'll have to send it to you via email. In the PDF, all of these are clickable. Um, they um, link directly to the website for you as well. All right, and then of course in Utah we have um, you know 15 domestic violence service providers uh, in our in our wonderful state, um, and they're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, and they offer a number of different services. And depending on the location, some locations specifically have um, immigration um, advocates and legal advocates um, specifically on site. Here is um, a great resource for anyone who's experiencing um, anything related to domestic violence, power and control, and technology. So NNEDV, the National Network to End Domestic Violence, has wonderful resources and toolkits for service providers, advocates, and they also have some for survivors. So it's really great. It breaks down, you know, different types of um, tech, kind of how they can be problematic, um, how they can be helpful. And it also has um, a web page that lists different apps that are great for survivors, um, that can be great for survivors. They also have some for um, um, Spanish speaking survivors and um, survivors who um, English is not their first language, um, and some that um, help even with folks who are um, seeking. Um, um, services um, and uh, immigration resources. And then we have the National um, Domestic Violence Hotline. And so this is available 24 um, hours a day, seven days a week. And they do have um, access to more than 200 different languages. So if you are unsure, you know, if you are, oh, I don't know, we don't have an interpreter, we don't have this, you know, we may not have resources um, that the National Network, um, their hotline does um, have over 200 um, different languages um, that are available. And they also have, excuse me, they also have a, a website and you can go down to it um, here at thehotline.org. Here is the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition's link line. So this is very similar to the National um, Domestic Violence Hotline. However, it's for specifically Utah. And this is the entire state of Utah. This is not just the Salt Lake area. So this is everywhere. So if you're calling from St. George, if you're calling from Richfield, um, and you're like, you know, I am having trouble finding um, resources for this survivor, call. Um, we have, you know, a huge, a huge book, and we have a huge list of resources um, for anything and everything that you can think of. So um, they are really great. Those advocates are really great um, at, you know, even being creative and figuring out how, um, what, what, you know, coming up with things with you to be able to do that. And it's really important to remember that it is not a counseling service, so we're un, unable to meet with folks um, individually. And then here is how you can find um, us, the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition. So we have a Facebook. Um, you can find information about upcoming webinars and training events there. We also have a Twitter, very similar um, information there. Um, we have a YouTube page, so you will be able to watch past webinars on our YouTube page. Um, we have um, a lot of videos on there right now. Everything from Domestic Violence 101 to specifically working with um, LGBTQIA survivors, and um, um, hopefully this one will go up there um, shortly. And then um, we have our website as well. And when you get the PDF version, these um, are all clickable, so you can just click those links and go right to those um, uh, websites. So here is my um, information. Um, so you can contact me at the coalition. You can contact me through our website, um, any of the pages um, relating to training, um, LGBTQIA survivors, um, it links directly to me. 
Um, and also here is my direct line to my office. Um, leave a voicemail. Um, usually um, when I'm in the office, I will easily be able to um, pick that up. And then we have, of course, um, Emily's information. Um, and can you um, break down this information a little bit more um, for them? Yeah. So like I mentioned, um, after June 12th, I will be only with Catholic Community Services of Utah. Um, we have an office in Salt Lake, but I am actually opening an office for them in Ogden. And cool. so that's why I'm senior immigration attorney for Northern Utah. Um, that phone number is their office number in Salt Lake. The reason why I'm only putting that is because they're in the process of moving, but that phone number will be the same. That email address is my email address that I'm using while I'm transitioning, um, but it's going to continue even after my transition. So if you have any questions or if you need any help or if you want me to do any trainings on anything immigration related, I'm happy to do them. Um, you can just use that email address. So. Thank you. Um, Emily is one of our, our greatest assets, one of our greatest partners. I'm always willing to re really um, get down to the, the details and dive deep into these immigration um, issues. And you've been a wonderful um, person to work with. So if anyone else has any more questions, we can get those quickly answered, you know, stay on for the last couple minutes. Um, if not, I hope everyone has a wonderful day and has learned a lot. And if you have any questions, please reach out to either one of us. Um, but yeah, ask your questions and we'll be able to get those answered um, in the next uh, couple minutes if there's any leftover questions. We have a lot of really great questions too um, that were asked throughout the webinar. All right, looks like maybe, you know, we don't have any uh, questions that are coming in right now. So um, thank you everyone for attending. Again, if you have any further questions, email one of us. Um, we can get those answers for you. And hope to see you again um, in two weeks. We will be having a um, webinar specifically on the federal um, harboring law and how it relates to domestic violence service providers. And that one's called Confidentiality, Victim Services, and Criminal Harbor Harboring. Um, so go make sure to register for that. That is a lot of really great information. It goes more into depth, especially with working with ICE that we talked about today, and um, a lot of information that uh, folks requested. So thank you so much. Enjoy your day. Enjoy your week. And I will um, see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you.